Hi everyone. So today I'm with my friend Victoria. Hi. And we are fortunate enough to get an interview from Max Howard. He was the producer of some of the most remarkable animated films in history, including The Lion King, Aladdin, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and The Iron Giant. He was also once the president of the Warner Brothers Feature Animation Division, and is now a partner for the International Animation Consulting Group. We'll be exploring his career from being a child actor to being a producer at Disney, Warner Brothers, and DreamWorks. Then we'll try to get his opinion on the current state of the animation industry. Here is the first episode of Behind the Frames. Enjoy. Okay, to start off, in terms of your career, could you tell us your journey in becoming who you are today? I mean, how did it work out for you? So,、um, I, you know, I started out as a as a child actor.、Um, I had a career in the theatre. You know, I was a stage manager, a, a director, and a producer in the in the theatre, and.、Uh, Suddenly, I was、uh, I, I got a call from the Walt Disney Company, who was setting up a movie in London called Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and they needed somebody who could run a studio, who could work with a creative group, and that's a certain style of management to understand working with creative people. You know, it, they're creative. You have to know, you know, how to handle them. You know, it's it, it, it's it's not like making a a widget. As it were, you 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 know you've got to treat everyone differently, and you've got to keep your eye on on, on the goal. So miraculously, I got this job, and it was 18 months of、uh, of work, which coming from the theatre was fantastic. Because if you work in the theatre, you know what you get is you're employed, and you get a paycheck for as long as people are coming to see the show. And if they're not, the show closes. So what had happened to me was I'd managed a very important revival of a play. It had not done very well. The press didn't like it. We ran five weeks. I was out of work. I was terribly disappointed. But lo and behold, the phone went, and it was somebody at the Walt Disney Company who I knew, and they were coming to London to set up this film. And I was available. And I often think back now because my that was an entire career change for me, going from you know the theatre to suddenly I was working and making an animated film, and I knew nothing about making an animated film. Um, but had that play been a success, we wouldn't be sitting here today. You wouldn't be asking me these questions, and we wouldn't be, you know, doing doing this interview. So, so and it was a lesson for me that sometimes you know when you experience great disappointment, out of that disappointment can actually be something fantastic happen. And that was what 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 happened to me on that occasion. You know, and off I went. I managed Roger Rabbit. I managed it. I put together the studio. I bought, found artists who could animate. It's a very complicated film, but I didn't direct it. It isn't my vision, but I suppose I helped, as we all did, in fulfilling that vision and created a film that was not only technically very interesting and garnered a lot of visual effects awards for its work, but also critically it was it was praised, and it became a sort of hip film. I think it, it gave Disney its.、Um, Uh, it made Disney cool, you know. It made Mickey it suddenly. It was, it, and it was one of the reasons the film was done in London. It had Disney animators on it, but it wasn't made by the Walt Disney Company. They wanted to sort of capture Bob Zemeckis, the director, wanted to capture, you know, all of the animation styles of the of the 1940s, which is when the film set. So it needed to, you know, capture. You know Warner Brothers, Tex Avery, as well as Disney, and so they hired a, an animation director based in London, Richard Williams, and built around him a studio, and that's where I came in to to, to manage that. But at the end of the film, I was going to go back to the theatre. You know, it was an 18-month contract. I was thrilled, and I was going to go back to、um, to my career. And I lived in London, had a young family, and you know, it was hey, I would look back on it as a great experience, but. What happened was that Disney、um, were expanding. They decided to get back into animation again and start making films on a very regular basis. And they just produced the Great Mouse Detective. They were doing Oliver and Company, and they had planned the Little Mermaid,、uh, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and the Lion King. And of course, suddenly they needed people who supposedly knew what they were doing. And I just managed a studio for them in London. So. They said, "Hey, why don't you come to America and do the same in the States?" So, off I went. Two years, and then I was going to come back to the UK, but I, you know, I never came back. I stayed there. Wow! So I see you had a pretty good run back then. 
Now, could you tell us briefly what you do as a producer and as a studio executive? Well, you know, when you when you use the term, you know, producer and studio executive, it's really difficult for you know it can be it can mean many different things. I'll I'll try and explain what I what I did, but I you know if I say I'm a movie director or I'm a screenwriter or I'm a editor, you know, or a sound mixer. Look, we're sitting in a in a sound mixing uh, desk. You sort of know what 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 that what those jobs do, but when it comes to studio executive or producer, it's difficult, and there are many different terms for producer and many different roles you know you can be a producer who just brings the money very very important but they don't actually make the film but they do provide the resources that's not me um, the producing I've done um, and that's I'll do producing first and then back into studio executive because really you know although I've been a producer in the theater um, my producing in animation came a little bit later. I was hired as a studio executive and that means you put everything together. You're responsible for the administrative side uh, and the overall uh, direction of the uh, of the studio. Uh, it could be training, it could be technologies, uh, everything it needs to make a film and then the, you know very you, know, you can have executives who are in charge of the development of an idea, the running of the studio, the training of the artists, the hiring of the artists. And so I was more in, in training and hiring and putting together the nuts and bolts when I first got there. And then as my role expanded uh, at Disney, I took over responsibility for setting up a studio in Paris for Disney and then another studio for um, in in uh, in LA when they moved to a, a new and bigger building. So I had this sort of overall oversight. But when I went to Warner Brothers as a studio executive, I was the chief executive. I was the president. So everything that happened in order to make a movie would have been my decision. You know, really recommending. I, I you know, but what movies to make? I enjoyed. I wanted to make and made it. Hiring Brad Bird to make that film. My, you know. So I, you, you're, you're, you then really are putting all the pieces together and uh, an overall responsible for doing that. And you know, for a studio executive, your success is really in who you hire and the decisions you take. You don't do the work yourself. I've never said, you know, I'm not an animator, but what I do try and do is bring the right people together. Now, when it comes to producing a film, you know, you're very much hands-on on one film. So as a studio executive, at Warner's, I was handling uh, you know the films that were in development as well as the films that were in production and the film that was in post-production they were all overlapping and coming over across my 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 desk as so to speak but when it comes to producing a particular movie you've got a sole focus you that movie and you might report to somebody like me but your sole focus is the well-being of that film and i do have a description of of what i think a producer does uh, and I like to use a, 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 a description because when I, talk, when I talk to people about pitching me an idea, I like them to get to the simplicity of the idea. And so particularly when I'm talking about producing, so, so, so what does a producer do? I, I want to try and articulate it in a couple of sentences. So I think a producer has to balance the creative vision. So that's the script, that's what the project is, with the resources that are available. That, essentially that in the end that's money but it's the number of people and the level of productivity you you expect of them and you you it's a, it's it's almost a yin yang situation uh, it's a balance of the two and they are both equal you have to have a great project and then you've got to manage it correctly so you get a, a project you get a finished film that's worthy of the script that you started out with so that organization so so you've got to do those that that but also to satisfy yourself, you have to recognize that there's never enough time and there's never enough money. And I've made films that have cost a lot of money. I mean, millions and millions of dollars. And I've made shorter, small films that really were done without any financial resources at all. I've never had too much money and I've never had too much time. You use everything you can. So, it, it, the, the, so the, what you then try and do is, is make sure you get, you say, okay, I'm not gonna worry. I'm not gonna go, oh, there's no time. Oh, I don't have enough money. It's about how you use the time and how you spend the money. Celebrate what you do have. Don't be frustrated with what you don't have. But equally, you look at the, the film you're trying to make and you make sure that you can make it you know and if you need to make compromises cutting 
eliminating characters, you know, figuring out how to shoot the same scene in the same set as opposed to have to build something else. Any of those tricks that one might have to do, you, you, you consider and you do. So that's, that's what a producer does. And that, oh, that's what I say I try and do. Thank you, that's a very descriptive answer. But as you mentioned, you switched from Disney to Warner Brothers and in the end I believe to DreamWorks. So was there ever a conflict of interest seeing how these three companies were actually major competitors? Yeah, it was, it was interesting. In 1995, which I think that's the year I left Disney, there was a massive change. What had happened in the industry is that Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was you know, one of my bosses at Disney and, you know, being very responsible for building animation. There was a, a, a sort of parting of the ways, let me say, at Disney and Jeffrey left. And with Steven Spielberg, they set up DreamWorks. At that same time, I got headhunted to go to Warner Brothers because the other studios looked at the success Disney had been having and the amount of money they'd been making from animation and their shareholders and everybody said, we've got to get in this business. So it was definitely a conflict. And in fact, I would refer to that period as almost called the animation wars, because essentially what I when I went to Disney and I first started on Roger Rabbit, there were probably about 150, 200 people working at Disney feature animation. When I left nine years later, we were probably 2000 people. We were making some film every four years. We we're making a film every year. We'd expanded. We had a studio in Paris. We had a studio in Florida. We had the big studio in L.A. We were making movies every year. And, and that expansion was huge of a lot of new technologies that had, that had come in. And then suddenly Jeffrey Katzenberg leaves. And then I go to Warner Brothers. Who are we trying to hire? People who were with us at Disney. And so it was a very challenging, difficult time, not only to try and make good films, but also really a great shortage of resources. So we were all training like crazy, hiring like crazy. One of the strategies I used is I set up a studio in London because I thought there was a lot of great talented artists in London and that allowed me to make to deliver the films that I was supposed to deliver at a, at a really good quality. But that was the challenge. You know, yes, there's all this money and everybody wanted to make all these films, additional films, not just the one a year from Disney, now one a year from DreamWorks and one a year from, from Warner Brothers, but there are only, there are only, there are only 2,000 people who really had experience in doing that. So yeah, it was, a, it was a very challenging time and it was definitely, I would say, not a conflict of interest, it was a competitive arena to say the least. Thank you so much for your answer. Now I think it's Vincent's turn to ask you other questions about CGI and animation. Hello, Vincent here from the future. So in this segment, I was asking about CGI or rather mixed media live action films that involves a huge amount of VFX animation, which has been a huge trend three years ago at that time. Most notably the quote live action remake of The Lion King, which the original one is one of the classic Disney movies that he produced. The following is his comment on this trend, and also separately his opinion on anime and online indie animation. Now back to the show. Thank you, Victoria. Okay, so Disney has remade classic animated features like Aladdin and The Lion King into live action movies. And now there's even similar movies that features classic video game characters like Detective Pikachu and Sonic the Hedgehog. Do you think studios nowadays are abusing this formula just for monetary reasons or has the story elements been lost for these films in pursuit of realism over entertainment? The, the film industry is a commercial venture, uh, particularly manifests itself in, in, in the States. I learned that very early on, you know, they make money and they can make more films and what, you know, they, they have a great sensibility of knowing what might be successful. All the studios make unsuccessful movies. Um, in fact, I think some of the most unsuccessful movies that have been made have been using game characters. I've never quite understood why, if you're a gamer and you love a game, why you'd want to go from an interactive experience to a passive experience. And I know there have been exceptions, but on the whole, a gamer doesn't really want to watch somebody else imagining that those characters in a game. So those movies tend to be less successful, but nevertheless, Hollywood's tried. Um, what's really interesting for the body of films that I've worked on, um, which were in fact traditional on the whole 2D movies, the ones we, we've talked about, um, is they've 
you know, 25 years later, um, they've been reimagined as live action films. And some more naturally because, you know, they're already fairy tales with human characters. So when we think Beauty and the Beast, you know, it's very easy, you know, you have actors and, you know, you, you animate the pieces within that that are the, uh, the animated characters, as it were. Um, but more recently, The Lion King is very interesting. I mean, it's a photorealistic recreation of The Lion King, shot for shot, as, except that it is photorealistic. Uh, it's a hard one for me because, you know, I, it, 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 if I was at Disney and I was in the position of those executives, I would have done exactly the same thing. But for somebody who worked on the film and loved the film, um, I don't get it creatively. I get it financially. So my why is what was in it creatively, and I think there was nothing um, at all. Um, and I, I, but but I don't disagree that it should be made because these companies are for profit, and a very successful film like you know The Lion King reimagined in live action, it'll take, it has taken much more money than the first one, huge profits. That money goes shareholders, um, it bringing new generation of of kids to watch this film, which has certainly done that, but also it generates money to make more films, other films. And so we should not worry about it. So I take the side that, hey, isn't it fantastic? A film that I worked on 25 years ago has been reimagined using a different technology, but being very faithful to the original film. I mean, to the extent that, it, that it, it, at times it's almost shot for shot the same the, the same movie. So how fantastic is that? Name a live action film or another film or another medium, another medium perhaps that does the same thing. Because when we talk about medium, you know, in, in live action, you know, camera, as I'm sitting here before you, it's me. When we get into animation, we are bringing art to life, not for art's sake, for story's sake. Um, and when we do that, these, these stories imagined through art become timeless and they live forever. You know, most kids have seen all of the films I worked on and, I, and I've and i seen, as well as they've seen, films that I saw when I was a child. Uh, and these films just keep on keep on entertaining. Now we're seeing them reimagined again, but with a new technology. Hey, isn't it fantastic? It just shows the power, the absolute power of animation as, a, as an entertainment medium. Now let's travel to the other side of the world and talk about Japanese anime. As I recall, you were at the screening of Weathering With You organized by the university last week. So, how much do you actually know about anime in general? Uh, well, let me say to you, I, I, anime is a bit of a... Um, I don't, I'm not very experienced with anime. Um, it's not something I know much about, and it's one of the things that being here and seeing, you know, the, the, the film last week, um, that I that I deliberately went to see it because I'm always, you know, it's very, very popular, albeit I would consider a minority and I want to be careful with that. It's popular, but it's not wildly popular like a Disney film, but it has an audience and it certainly has an audience, a large audience in Asia. And I marvel at, at, um, at Japanese animation generally because the it's loved there. It is so well received and to the extent that they've been able to hang on to this unique art form and have, have, have a unique form of storytelling, but haven't had to adapt to perhaps a way America or a Hollywood studio might make the same story, which I think that says, says a lot. And I think that's inc incredibly important. In fact, we learn a lot from Japanese films, into, often in terms of staging, not in terms of the performance of the, uh, 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 of the acting, but camera. I think we learn a lot about camera from, from anime. It's always very, very interesting. Um, I did think the film we saw last week, um, and it had a difficult title, and I like to go on about titles quite a lot because and now I can't remember the title because the title didn't really make... I always like titles to be about the central characters. Um, and whenever they're not, I think it, they become harder to recall it's not that you can't have, and you could break any rule of any filmmaking. There's no absolute hard and fast rules, but there are there are certain guidelines. But you know, when we think, for example, of Disney films, we think Bambi, we think The Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, The Little Mermaid, you know, Aladdin, um, Frozen. There's always something in the title that directly connects you to the characters in the story, and quite often the name of those characters, and that's fine. Toy Story. I mean, these are these are very, very. I mean, Toy Story. When I first heard it, I wasn't sure it was a good title. It is a fantastic title. Um, 
But when you get off on these other ones, it, 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 I don't think they serve the story well. Um, but I, I, I think anime is great. When I was at Warner Brothers, I, I sent one of my executives to Japan because I wanted to philosophically meet in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, get an anime director, but with, with, with Hollywood storytelling and put the two together. I never found anybody. I never found a Japanese director who, who wanted to do that, because why would they? They had a very successful industry, they were doing what they wanted to do, and I could, I could do nothing but admire them for that. But I did have this vision of trying to, trying to put the two together, not bringing them just purely to make an American style movie, but somehow, as I said, philosophically meeting in the middle middle of the Pacific Ocean, bring, bring, bring skills from both sides and create something unique. It's not something I was successful at. Well, although not exactly a situation you're talking about, there's actually examples of Western animation that try to imitate the style of Japanese anime. One that came up immediately on top of my head is a cartoon called Avatar The Last Airbender, produced by Nickelodeon. And despite being extremely popular, a lot of young art students, mainly in Western countries, have been discouraged or even forbidden by their instructors and professors to draw in anime style. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not going to comment on 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 uh, anybody discouraging anybody else because that's that, that's hearsay to me. I, I've I've never heard that. What I do know is that is that what, uh, let's call them Hollywood for the sake of it. But the other side of the Pacific, people look at and learn things from 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 anime. But I think, as I have done, and you will do, and every student here will do, you learn from films and stories that have already been written or told. And you're, you're being inspired by them. You're gonna use certain ideas, you're gonna adapt certain ideas. There's very few stories. You know, I have a, a saying, that, well, a, an example that I believe that Terminator, first Terminator movie, Harry Potter and Star Wars are the same idea. Now, the reason they're the same idea is you take a very vulnerable character when they're not old enough to defend themselves and you hide them and you train them because there's somebody who wants to kill them. It's the same setup in each. Now, the, uh, of course it doesn't matter. It's the story and the unfolding of that and the characters and everything that goes into it that make it feel so different and they are so different but conceptually it's exactly the same root in fact you could argue religiously it's Jesus and Herod you know Herod the king wants to find the so-called you know king of the Jews who's gonna one day rule the world you know so he tries to tries to kill him so these origins of these stories it, it then it's what how we tell them what world we put them in and how, how we adjust them that make them unique and fantastic so this idea of of copying or not copying is 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 not a sound argument. As filmmakers, our job is to learn and understand and then adapt. When I, when I talk about you know I often get people you know when I'm talking teaching my story class, and people say well I don't want to make a um, a formulaic movie I don't want to make a Hollywood movie I don't want to do this, and. Um, I, I, I think it's a very easy thing to say, you know, I just want to break all the rules of storytelling. Well, my first rule of breaking the rules of storytelling is to understand the rules completely and understand why it's okay to break that rule. And then if you have a good reason and it makes sense, break it and do something completely different, but do it from the point of view of knowledge, not the point of view of some sort of predetermined prejudice you have or dislike that you have. Figure it out. Figure it out why a great filmmaker will grab you in the first few minutes of a movie, take you on a journey where you care what happens to the characters and you love them and you with them and then you come to some type of resolution. Not necessarily a happy ending, can be a deeply disturbing ending, but you care, you leave the theater moved in, in, in some way. Well, that comes from a, an amazing technique of understanding how to manipulate an audience because filmmaking is manipulation. You are manipulating the audience into, into caring about something. 
It's not, you're not just throwing anything at them, you're, you're, you're making them care. You, you want to make them laugh and you want to make them cry, but above all, you want to make them care. So, during the interview from the NSC Animation Film Festival earlier this year... Oh, my word, okay, yeah, <laughs> right. You've said that one of the wildest dreams of yours is to see a greater diversification of film and animation. But from what I see, the dream is certainly becoming a reality, isn't it? Especially with the help of the internet and streaming platforms like YouTube and Netflix. Yeah, in, uh, in 2010, I think it was, I was, uh, in fact, it was a fantastic honor. I was on the jury at the Annecy Animation Festival for its 50th anniversary. So it was a, oh my God, John Musker was on there, and Nick Park from Ardman, uh, Sir Tim Rice, who wrote all the lyrics for, you know, for Lion King, wrote partly the lyrics for Aladdin. You know, I mean, just, it was marvelous. And I've met some fantastic people and I was interviewed there and talked about, I think I talked about the, you know, the future and what I, what I thought where we would go. And back then there were still relatively few films made. And I, and I think, you know, we've seen such a massive change uh, in, in, in what's gone on. Um, and, and number one, the cost of te the technology that allows you to make films has come right down. It's affected every form of filmmaking, live action. You know, we used to deal with film stock, now we deal with digital cameras, we can reshoot, we can shoot as much as we want. That used to be a real problem. You know, printing, a, printing film was very, very expensive. So the cost has come down. So what that did, that immediately leveled the playing field because now it's about how good you are as a filmmaker, not about whether you had access to any sort of barriers. So there were all these barriers you, could, you couldn't do. Yes, it's CGI came in, all the software, you know, now very usable, computer power. When I first started using computer graphics, I was on, we used to buy SGIs and calculate, I think, for budgetary. We'd spend 250,000 US dollars to get one person working. That was the cost of the hardware and the software because it was all so expensive, you know, the overall cost. Of, well, now, you know, it's a few thousand dollars to get somebody working. So again, it's now about talent, not about technology. Technology is there to support the talent. So that opened up enormously. Uh, in more recent years, and I think it was already happening in 2010, we'd seen the advent of more and more studios. Nobody, when I first was working at Disney, you know, we made 2D films, and if somebody else made a 2D film and it didn't have Disney's name on it, people didn't go and see it. It could be great, but they wouldn't go. Because Disney made, in the public's eyes, Disney made animation. When it came to CGI, although Pixar was very much the leader, it didn't carry the same power. Audiences went to see a film based on the film itself, which is how you go and see live action. When you go to a live action movie, you might go because you like the star or the director, but you don't have an opinion as to which studio made a particular film. You don't even know, one doesn't even know, who made a particular film. You know, I could say a film like Titanic, I mean, a fairly old film now, but Titanic is interesting because in America it was released by 20th Century Fox, but in the rest of the world it was released by Paramount. So, but it, but it didn't matter. People went to see it because they'd heard it was good. It was maybe James Cameron, two big movie stars, but she went for other reasons. And animation has finally gone there. Yes, if it's a Disney film or a Pixar film, but it doesn't, didn't stop Despicable Me being a su wonderfully successful series of films. The public didn't say, oh, it's not from Pixar, it's not from Disney, I won't go and see it. And of course, DreamWorks have done exactly the same with their How to Train Your Dragon series. I mean, many Shrek. And so that stigma went away. That was fantastic for the industry. And then more latterly, what we have now is you have a lot of small independents coming in and making films, lots of very different types of films, really directly, as I said earlier, around the the cost of the technology, you can, you can now, whereas before you couldn't. Um, and now what's going on at the moment are the platforms. This new, you know, we have, we have, you know, Hulu and Amazon and YouTube and, and Apple TVs about, or Apple Plus or whatever it's called, Disney is starting their own thing. And of course, all really built originally around Netflix. Um, 
Netflix are the ones suffering, incidentally, because everyone's taking their content off Netflix, but Warner Brothers are starting their own streaming service. What does this mean? More opportunity for distribution, more investment for the young filmmaker, um, and so there are opportunities that weren't there before. It's still about talent, you've still got to write a great story, create a great idea, but now there are more places for your work to be to be seen and more buyers willing to buy that albeit it's a totally different model so as mentioned briefly before youtube has allowed more independent animators to tell personal stories conduct education and even do comedy sketches and parodies in the form of animation and some of the most successful ones has even earned over 12.7 million subscribers on their channels why do you think they are able to gain such a success with such a large audience, despite having limited budget and resources? Um, what's really interesting about the um, about these platforms is that we're no longer locked into a particular length. You know, when it was, you know, the, the clips I've just looked at, you know, you you might have collectively said, oh, a few years ago, that's TV animation. It's a much simpler style. It's seen on a smaller screen. Artistically, that means it's much more forgiving. You know, when you when you see animation on a big screen, it, it, it requires a higher quality. Um, what you get with YouTube or any of these platforms is you get short form entertainment. You can be anything. Play it on an iPhone. Play it on anything at all. And there are now filmmakers in Hollywood or anywhere in the world making short form entertainment just little one-offs you're sitting on a bus you're sitting on a metro you're sitting on the MTR and you can just watch something for a few minutes so there's nothing good or bad some of the animation is incredibly simple some will be more sophisticated it that that's unimportant what is important is the content is what the filmmaker is trying to say if it lasts 30 seconds or three minutes or three hours what what's it about and then it, are they telling it in the in a, in a very witty and funny way but I'd, I and it, we can think nothing but great things about about this these platforms and this expansion because it's more opportunity it's not better or worse it's like me saying you know oh you should only make films that are in stereoscopic 3d well we know that's no longer true but a few years ago people would have told you that your film had to be stereo in stereo but then we discover that people don't like it particularly people who wear glasses or it's more expensive, makes people feel sick. And there are certain films that of course should be seen in 3D because, oh, we could mention Avatar, for example. In IMAX 3D, it's fantastic. But other films, it's not necessary. But what all of these platforms, all of these technologies, all of these ideas are tools in a toolbox for a filmmaker. They're just more opportunities. No one rule. We don't all convert, okay, we're gonna do everything like this because YouTube. No, it, everything coexists. You didn't have that a few years ago, you know. Um, and, and people, you know, what I don't think is gonna be successful as a replacement of the movies is VR. VR will have its place, it's fantastic, but it won't take over from anything else. It'll be another thing, it's great fun. But frankly, you know, we go to the, you know, let's take the cinema, for example. We go to the cinema, we're social creatures, right? We like to go out. You could watch anything at home. You don't ever have to go out. You could have your food delivered. You could live at home. You don't need to go out, but that's not true. We need to go because we like to socialize and we might be a boy wanting to meet a girl or a girl wanting to meet a boy. A cinema is a neutral territory to do that. You go say, hey, let's go see a movie together. Are you truly going to see the movie as your motivation or are you going out on a date because there's a girl that you'd like to have a relationship with? So we often, you know, we go out and be entertained for all sorts of reasons. It's not just the, oh, the passion of the film. It's the passion to be with friends and to go out. It's the same when people say to me, um, you know, well, you know, because you could now have very good home cinema, you can have some fantastic, great sound systems and fantastic huge TVs and, oh, it'll kill the cinema. No, it won't. No, it won't. And the, the analogy for that is at home you have a kitchen. I have a kitchen. My mum and dad have kitchens and cook some food. There's a lot of restaurants in the world. So in theory, I could cook at home all the time. I could stay at home. But what, we don't want to go because we want to go out.
because going out to eat and socializing with other people is part of it. So all of these, all of these um, different opportunities, they are additions. They don't kill anything. They don't stop anything. They will never stop the movies. They will never stop the you know, ballet or theater or opera, or anything else. They will not do that. Take, take a museum and an art going to a museum to see original artwork. Yeah, I can see any piece of art on my computer screen in some sort of fairly high definition and get a real sense of it and study it. Does that stop me going to the museum to see the original? Of course not, of course not. So th the fear factor from all of these changes has to be removed and the opportunities celebrated. Okay, now to wrap this up, there's certainly someone out there who is like us are uh, either to enter the animation industry. So what advice do you have for them to get started? Should they start from learning art fundamentals or you know one of the one of the questions that I'm I'm often answered, you know what what you know what what should a, a young aspiring you know animator filmmaker you know do? What should they do? Well, I think you have to go to the movies study the movies. Actually, I like people reading scripts. I like people reading screenplays as particular. Screenplays are very hard to read because they're not designed to be read. The screenplay is designed to be heard and seen, but not read. So, uh, but you know, looking at films you like, equally looking at films you don't like, and then trying to figure out why you didn't like them. You know, particularly the movie that, it, that didn't work for you. And, it's, and remember, it's for you. You'll probably find other people who loved it. But, but if a movie isn't speaking to you, figure out why. Why? And, it, and it'll be this reason, essentially. You didn't care. You weren't grabbed by it. You weren't interested by it. You didn't care what happened to the characters. You didn't, you didn't get the jeopardy. But there'll be reasons why it didn't work. The aspirations, there could be great filmmakers involved. But it'd be like, um, it'd be like in a, in a, a, a chef in a restaurant. You've got all the ingredients, but somehow, the dish didn't turn out right. And that means that the ingredients probably went in the wrong order and weren't cooked long, whatever it is. But that anal analyzing these films will help enormously with your opinion and your development. I think the same goes in terms of animation. Most animators see it as, as moving art. Yeah, that's the technique. You're moving, and let's say it's CGI, of course, you know, it could be 2D, but if it's CGI, you've got a model, it's been rigged. And, it, and you can move the rig. Um, yeah, and you learn technically how to do that. When you move something, why? So here am I waving my hand away. Why, why am I doing it? I'm doing it for a reason. That, that if an animator thinks of himself as an actor, then his performance will be coming from here. Not on the outside, but on the inside. You, It, it will it will help, it will help with his timing, his thinking. Acting, as the great actor Michael Caine says, is about, you know, particularly in movies, is about listening. You know, listening to the other actor, being engaged, but, but be, learning to act and what acting is will help the performance enormously. Because a technical actor, you know, I, oh, I look surprised, I've got to raise one eyebrow, or, you know, or yeah, I've got my gesture for anger, or my jet. no, 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 no. We can be much more subtle than that. And the subtlety of those movements will be completely understandable and will absolutely work if the animator is thinking about what the character's thinking about. Because as you and I are talking now, we've got two voices going on. We've got the voice that we're speaking with and we've got the subtext of what we're, you know, we're like far ahead or how I want to say something. So if, you, if an animator can put himself inside a character, his performance will be so much better and he'll be a great animator. Because for me, that's the difference. A great animator understands acting. Is there any institution that you would recommend for somebody who want to study in an art school or film school? Yeah, you're at it, you're here. Well, okay, so you, recommendations for where to study. Well, I don't really. I mean, I, I think a lot about studying. Um, is about who you're in school with. It's, your, it's often about your fellow students. Um, there are famous uh, acting schools in, 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 in England, for example, there's a very famous one called RADA. It had a particular year in the late 1950s where the entire class became movie stars. 
I think it was Julie Christie, Peter O'Toole, Albert Finney. I mean, it's an endless list. They were all unbelievably successful. And, and often what happens, it's your fellow student, the camaraderie of the students, the ambition of those students, the ability to inspire each other that actually can make a, a, a make turn into a great school. So it's not necessarily going to the school, it's who you're in the school with. Now that's luck. That can't be, you know, that's just, I don't know how you manufacture that opportunity. But I suppose if you put that into your head, that really you will benefit most. Yes, you'll learn from the teachers and everything else. But when it comes down to it, you know, a relationship with a colleague, talking to them about what you're trying to do, listening about what they're trying to do, and, and, and create a give and take, go to the movies together, talk about it. You'll create uh, a learning platform that will be amazing and you'll probably be friends for life and you'll probably work together when you graduate so I think there's a lot to be said for that there are many great great schools with great equipment we're sitting in a room here at the university you know this 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 mixing desk behind me is of the highest possible standard I mean it you know it technically it's absolutely superb how you use that equipment and who you use it with will define whether it worked for, for you so yeah there are great there are great schools but more important who you're in school with and what can you do to help your fellow student and what can they do to help you and inspire you well i guess that's all the question we have thank you again for this interview and i hope to speak with you again in the future my pleasure